Welcome. Today, we have the honor of hearing from a Holocaust survivor who has graciously agreed to share his story with us today. We are also amazed that he will be 100 years old at the end of this month, so this is a priceless opportunity for many reasons. We know he has endured unimaginable suffering during one of the darkest periods in human history. We must reflect on his story with the utmost respect and empathy and listen carefully to his experiences. His testimony serves as a reminder of the resilience of human spirit in the face of unspeakable cruelty. Dr. Jacob Eisenbach had 100 family members in the Holocaust. He was the only one to survive. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Jacob Eisenbach. I want to thank Brittany and your principal for inviting me to speak to this group. And I want to thank you students for your interest in the greatest crimes against humanity which were carried out by the Nazis I appreciate you being here, and I spoke many times to young people, and I'm very happy to be here today to speak to you. I was born into, I was very lucky to be born into a wonderful, loving family. My parents adored each other. My father treated my mother like a queen, and she treated my father like a king. They had a special talent. They had four children. My older sister, Fela, three years older, and I had two younger brothers. I was the oldest of the three brothers. It was Sam, two years younger, and Henry, five years younger. Hitler came to power as a chancellor of Germany, it was equivalent to a prime minister. He was all powerful. He was named chancellor in 1933. And after he became the chancellor, he started arming the German army to prepare them for war. They so did that secretly. They so had an air force, they so had ammunition, heavy armaments, trucks, motorcycles, tanks, everything they needed to start the war. I was asked the question, why did Hitler hate the Jews? I did some research on that subject, and I found a book with Hitler's speeches on page 222 of that book, Hitler said why he hated the Jews. And I quote, Providence has ordained that I become 
the greatest liberator of mankind from ancient and outdated ideas of justice and morality. I want to build a 1,000 year German Imperium without justice and without morality. How would you like to live in a world like this? And the people who brought these ideas to the world were the Jews, and they are in my way. And this is why I have to eliminate the Jews. Hitler committed suicide. He failed to build his 1,000 year German Imperium without justice and morality. In 1939, in June, that was just a few months before the outbreak of World War II on September 1st, 1939. There was a ship arriving at the American shores with 947 Jewish refugees who were escaping from the terror of the Nazi rule and earth for asylum in the United States. That asylum was denied to them. Who was the person who was responsible for that decision? It was the American Secretary of State Cordell Hall, who was telling President Roosevelt that we cannot allow these people to come to the United States because they do not have return addresses. Preposterous! What a poor excuse for anti-Semitism. He did not wear a swastika on his arm, but he carried hatred in his heart. That ship had to turn back and go back to Europe. And the Nazis killed many of these refugees. Some of them received asylum in other European countries. A few days after the outbreak of the war, on September 1st, 1939, Hitler signed the non-aggression pact with Joseph Stalin, who was the president of the Soviet Union. They decided that they will divide Poland and not interfere with each other's activities. Stalin, the president of the Soviet Union, took over Eastern Poland and the Nazis took over Western Poland. And I was in the Western Poland under the Nazis. When Hitler started the war, September 1st, 39, he attacked Poland 
and he took over my hometown of Lodz in seven days without firing a single shot. Poland had nothing to defend themselves. It was totally unexpected. Poland did not have an air force. They did not have ammunition. They did not have tanks. They had nothing the only way that they could defend themselves and on, on horses. The only place where fighting took place was in the city of Warsaw, which was the capital of Poland. And that fight lasted three weeks, and Poland was defeated. When the Nazis occupied my hometown of Lodz, which had 700,000 in population, and half of that population was Jewish. They took the old part of the city and built a wrought iron fence around that part of the city. Every 200 feet along that fence was a watchtower guarded by Nazi soldiers with machine guns and searchlights so nobody could come in or get out. They locked up that ghetto hermetically a few months after they marched into Poland. On May 1st, 1940, and they issued an order. All Jews must be inside that ghetto before that date of May 1, 1940. And any Jew found outside the ghetto after that date will be shot to death on the spot. After they locked up that ghetto, we were completely cut off from any communication with the rest of the world. We had no radio, no newspapers, no mail. We had no idea what they are doing outside of that ghetto. Before that ghetto was locked up, some Jewish people from Lodz managed to escape to the Russian part of Poland. The Russians did not kill Jews. Among those people who escaped was my sister Fela. She just completed high school and was admitted to the university to study pharmacology, but her plan never was materialized because of the war. So she and some of her girlfriends escaped to the Russian part of Poland and settled in the city of Lvov, L-W-O-W. Later on, the Nazis took over that city and Nazi soldiers with machine guns killed 110,000 Jews who lived in the ghetto of the city of Lvov. They killed all 110,000 with machine guns in three days including my sister Fela. I heard that story from a lady who managed to escape from the city of Lvov. I met her after the war 
and she told me what happened there. After they locked up the ghetto, they had full control of the food supply to the ghetto. And they gave us just enough food to prevent us from dying from starvation. But I saw many people dying from starvation in the streets of the ghetto. One day, my youngest brother, Henry, was 11 years old at the time. And he wasn't feeling good. And we had a, our own Jewish doctors in the ghetto, and two hospitals were included in the ghetto. He had a fever of 105. In addition to starvation, we had a typhus epidemic in the ghetto. We called the doctor, he examined him, and diagnosed him with typhus and told us to take him to the hospital. So we took him to one of the two hospitals. The next day, I was on my way. Seanwald or Avi and Terry Seanwald. Excuse me, I have to turn my phone call away. So we took him to one of the two hospitals. And I was on my way to my job. I had a new job there. And I was passing one of the two hospitals. And it was not the one that we took to brought my brother in the day before. And what do I see in front of the hospital? was a big truck with spaces between the boards, the kind of truck that is used to transport cattle. And they were loading all patients who were in the hospital on that day on that truck. 30 layers of live people on top of each other. And that truck was taken to the concentration camp of Auschwitz, which was one of several concentration camps where they had guest chambers. And all of those people who were taken to Auschwitz concentration camp were guessed to death in the guest chamber of Auschwitz. When I saw that, I started running to the other hospital where my brother was. On the way, I passed another truck just like it already loaded with patients from the other hospital. And I stopped for a moment to look between the boards to see if I can spot Henry. I couldn't see him. The driver of the truck had a companion, a Nazi soldier with a machine gun. The streets were deserted. And when he saw me watching the truck, he started shooting at me with his machine gun. But his bullets 
did not reach me because I was in front of an apartment building and I ran into that building. And that truck continued away from the hospital and I continued running toward the hospital. And what do I see there? A third truck being loaded with patients, guarded by Nazis with machine guns. The hospital compound was surrounded by an eight-foot fence. I couldn't get in, so I went to the back of the hospital and nurses were handing patients over to a crowd outside the fence of the hospital to save them from the Nazis. I climbed that eight foot fence. To this day, I can't figure out how I climbed an eight foot fence. I'm five foot four, or I was five foot four at that time. <clears throat> but I walked up to the room where I put my brother Henry in the day before, and Henry was not there. So I asked the nurses, where is Henry? And they told me he was carried out 15 minutes ago. He was in that truck. I saw on my way to the hospital. So I have never seen Henry again. Sometime later on, there were shipping Jewish people from the ghetto by train loads. Seven, eight thousand people per train load to camps like Auschwitz, Majdanek, and Treblinka. Most of them to Auschwitz. And the Polish train conductors were telling us that they taking these train loads of people to Auschwitz and no one ever comes out of there. And they could smell burning flesh in the air. So we knew what they are doing. They were telling these people that they're going to other camps for work, but that was a big lie. When they got there, they loaded them in the guest chambers. They told them they're going to take a shower. But instead of water coming out of the shower heads, it was the deadly gas of Cyclone V. And they were all dead in three minutes. And then they dropped the dead bodies into crematoria and burned them into ashes. One day, my father receives an order for deportation. With 600 other men. And I never knew what happened to him until after the war. One of these 600 men managed to escape from the group. And he told me what happened to the 600. The Nazis had them carry heavy rocks from place to place, useless work on a starvation diet, and they all died out. That left, left me and my brother Sam, two years younger, in the ghetto. 
One day I received an order for deportation and I knew that that was a death sentence. I disobeyed the order. I did not report. My brother Sam did not receive the order to report and he didn't have to go. We were hiding in a place in a room upstairs with squeaking wooden floors, 20 below zero outside and 20 below zero inside. And we were hiding in a pile of straw in the corner of that room. It was empty except that pile of floor. Of, of straw. And we were there for a few days and neighbors were telling me that the police was there looking for me. And I had a padlock placed outside that door by a friend. And when the police saw the padlock, they turned away and walked away. But one day, we hear heavy bootsteps. Two policemen are coming up. One of them had a flashlight. And he saw the padlock and he says to the other policeman, well, there's no one here, let's go. And the other policeman was a wise guy and he says, no, let's not go. Let's knock off the padlock and look inside. So they went downstairs, brought a crowbar, knocked off the padlock and opened the door. And the first policeman with the flashlight looks around, were hidden in that pile of straw. And he says, well, the room is empty, there's nobody here, let's go. And the other policeman says, no, let's not go. Let's look at that pad at that pile of straw and see what's going on. And they find us. And I knew that this is going to be my end, that I'm going to be taken to the guest chambers. My brother didn't have to go. And he could have said, Jack, I know where you're going. I'm not going with you. But this is not what my brother Sam said. What he said, Jack, our whole family is now gone. It is only the two of us that are still here. I'm not staying here by myself. I'm going with you. Wherever you go, I go. And whatever happens to you will happen to me. That's the kind of love relationship we had in our family. They put us into a train for three days and three nights. And they took us to Auschwitz. I was in front of the guest chamber. I was just about to be unloaded into the guest chamber. But suddenly, the train conductors got orders to take us away from there and to take us to a safe place. I have no other explanation for this event except that it was a miracle. This is the kind of miracle that I have survived being in dangerous places and taken away into safety.
I was taken to a munition factory in the city of Skarzysko. And there was an adjoining concentration camp, adjoining the factory with 6,000 Jewish slaves who were operating the factory for the Nazis. So I decided to move the factory from Skarzysko to the city of Częstochow because the Eastern Front was getting closer and Częstochow was farther away from the front lines. And we had to move heavy machines from that factory two three-ton machines on wooden rollers to Chesterhoff. One of my best friends fell on the one of those machines and broke a leg. And he was screaming in excruciating pain. And a Nazi soldier came along, took out his gun, and put a bullet in his head. My blood was boiling, but my best friend was dead. Hitler organized an army of volunteers. He didn't trust the German army, so he organized an army of SS volunteers. They knew what they volunteering for. To persecute and kill Jewish people. SS was under the command of General Heimlich Himmler, who indoctrinated the SS soldiers to kill Jews without mercy, and they did. On January 15th, 1945, my brother Sam and I were liberated from the concentration camp in Chastokhov. I met my future wife in that concentration camp. She was there already when we were delivered there. And I got married a few months after the war. Uh, the Jewish commander of that camp told us To stay put, don't leave the camp in the middle of the night, because the Nazi soldiers got orders to run for their lives with their machine guns, because the Russians are left in them. So on January 16, 1945, they all disappeared into the thin air. You couldn't see a single one. And Jewish, Jewish commander advised us, wait till the morning, don't walk out of the camp. So we listened to his advice. The next morning, my brother Sam and my future wife walk out of the camp. The first thing we were looking for was food. We were starved. And we found a Nazi army truck loaded with food, salamis, cheeses, and vodka, but we didn't drink. And we were told 
to take small amount of foods because our bodies are not used to metabolize normal amount of foods and gradually work itself up. So we did. And we managed to get to the city of Lodge, our hometown. Anybody who survived, that's the first place they went, is their hometowns to see who else in their family survived. And there were a few of my cousins that were still alive. I enrolled at the University of Lodge, and my brother Sam joins the Polish army. He was 20 years old at the time, and within two years, he obtained a very high rank in the Polish army. He had the rank of colonel and he was in charge of a division of 10,000 soldiers, which was unheard of, of a young man of 22 to have such a great position. One rank under a general. Two years later, when he was 22 years old, the army decided to send him to the city of Bialystok, 60 miles from Lodz. Bialystok was known to be a very anti-Semitic city. So Sam changed his name from Sam Eisenbach to Stanislav Adamowski, as Polish as you can get it to hide his Jewish identity. But the Polish anti-Semites found out that Stanislav Adamowski was a Jew. And one day he came home from work, from his office in Bialystok, and a Polish anti-Semite was already sitting there waiting for him. And as soon as he came in, he put a bullet in his head and killed him. That happened two years after the end of the war. My wife and I left Poland in 1946. after a pogrom in the city of Kielce. A pogrom meant persecuting and killing Jewish people. And the Polish anti-Semites came out into the streets of Kielce with crowbars, and they killed 43 of the remaining few Jewish survivors of the Holocaust. And my wife and I decided that tomorrow then I come to Lodz and do the same thing. So we decided to leave Poland, but we couldn't leave. It was occupied by the Russians. And they had a policy of not allowing their citizens to leave their country because they didn't want them to see how people live in free societies. So it was a Jewish organization in Palestine. Israel wasn't created until 1946. That the name of that organization was Bricha, which in Hebrew means escape. And they took us out 
in the middle of the night through the border of Poland into Czechoslovakia. And I don't have enough words to praise the Czech people. They were very friendly and very good to us. They had beautiful tables with delicious food and elegant trains, passenger trains, and they told us they'll take us any place you want to go, any place in the world. And my wife and I decided to go to the German, to the part of Germany which was occupied by the Nazis. And we settled in the city of Frankfurt and I enrolled at the University of Frankfurt College of Dentistry and we stayed there for four years. I got my doctorate at the University of Frankfurt and we left Germany. We had no intention of staying there. We left Germany a few months after I got my degree and came to the United States. That was the best move we have made. We came to the United States in 1950. I was 27 years old. And the rules here were that if you have a foreign degree, you cannot practice dentistry in the United States. You have to have an American degree. There are 43 dental schools in the country, and they admitted 6,000 freshman students every year. And they had 1,000 applicants. Out of 1,000 applicants, they could admit only one and turn away. 999. I applied to all of these dental schools to be admitted with advanced standing because I already had a doctorate. And they all turned me down because they didn't have the room. So I came to Iowa from Brooklyn. I dragged by bus for two days and two nights, a thousand miles. And I come to Iowa. And it was a beautiful campus. A new dean was taking over. And he admitted me with advanced standing. They put me into the junior class. So I ended up with two doctor degrees in dentistry. I practiced dentistry for 62 years, specializing in implants and cosmetic dentistry. I retired at the age of 92, but I did not retire. I assumed a new profession of becoming an international speaker. And I didn't speak about dentistry. I spoke about the dangers of hate, about Holocaust, and about genocides. I wrote a book entitled Entitled The Freedom. And I produced and directed a documentary movie, which is seen on, the, on YouTube all over the world at no charge.
were taught in the Jewish tradition, treat your neighbor as you would like to be treated yourself. And your neighbor was not only the person next door, was the person 3,000 miles away or thousands of miles any place in the world, whenever you meet any person, be kind to him. So I have a message for you. Guard your precious minds ex against accepting ideas of hatred. Hatred is just a word, but it's a dangerous word. And speak about what you hear here today, because we should not allow the story of the biggest crimes in human history perpetrated by the Nazis we should not allow these crimes to be erased from human memory. Now, if you have any questions, I'll answer any questions you'll ask me. I just have one request. Don't ask me questions of political nature. I don't deal in controversial subjects. I only deal with subjects that I have personally experienced. So please. Thank you, Dr. Eisenbach. And yes. I know you forced me to tell you a five minute warning, but is there any, you have no time limit. So is there anything else you want to say? Say it again, I didn't hear you. Is there anything else you wanted to say? Because I, I didn't want to cut you off. Is that enough? Okay. The first question, um, thank you for all the students who did email me a question. We look forward to sharing them with you today. What did you learn from your experience that we can incorporate in our lives as middle schoolers? Get a little closer, repeat the question. What did you learn from your experience that we can incorporate in our lives as middle school students? So what did you learn that they can apply to their lives? Some of you will become leaders, maybe local leaders, regional leaders, maybe world leaders. And you will be influential. And I would like to ask you to keep talking about the Holocaust and genocides. The Holocaust killed about six million innocent Jewish men, children, and women. There was an Israeli speaker by the name of Abba Ibn, one of the greatest speakers in the world in the class of Churchill, Oxford educated. He was invited to speak to the synagogue in Newport Beach. I canceled all my appointments. I didn't want to miss a single word that he says. And this is what he said. He made a prophetic prediction that Israel is here to stay forever. And another prophetic prediction that a Holocaust will never happen again because Israel is here. 
How did this experience affect and change you as a person? How did this experience change you as a person? <laughs> I was moved to do whatever I can to prevent another Holocaust. What do and, you feel? And If you're interested, you may find out what you can do individually to prevent the Holocaust by calling the National Museum of the Holocaust in Washington, D.C., and they will tell you, they will give you any information that you want. Mankind should know that murders and genocide of innocent people should stop. There was an American Secretary of State who wrote a book, Preventing Genocides, in cooperation with, with a former Secretary of Defense. And they are describing a very effective way of preventing genocides and holocaust. And try to obtain a copy of that book from the museum in Washington, D.C. Any other questions? What did it feel like when the Allies rescued you? What was one of the first things you wanted to do? What did it feel like when you were rescued? What was one of the first things you wanted to do? Uh, one of the first things I wanted to do, we were starved and we were looking for food and we found, we found a German truck loaded with food. Then I enrolled at the university got my second doctorate degree at the University of Iowa. And a new dean was there. He took over on January 1st. And he admitted me with advanced standing and put me into the junior class. So in two years, I got my second degree. And I practiced in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, 25 miles from Iowa City, where the university is. There was no anti-Semitism in Iowa. In fact, in the 70 years that I have lived in this country, I never experienced personally anti-Semitism. Not that it isn't there, it is. But I love the American people, they're open-minded. And those who are anti-Semites are a small group and they were a very small following. The Jewish people have contributed a lot to the civilization of the world. And I am proud to be Jewish. And I will remain Jewish for the rest of my life and I became a member of the Chabad organization, which is an Orthodox Jewish organization. 
so 4,000 temples all over the world. And I learned a lot about Jewish history, Jewish philosophy of life, and Jewish religion. And I'm proud to be a member of Chabad. What kept you going during your experiences? How did you maintain hope? Old conversations. And I learned many lessons that have helped me throughout my life. And I would like to share with you one lesson which I consider the most important lesson. If you are at the bottom of the pit and you cannot go any deeper, never lose hope. No matter how dark the clouds may be, there will always be a day when the sun will break through. And the sun did break through for me. We paid a high price. We suffered tremendous losses. We lost six million of innocent Jewish men, women, and children. But we won the war against the Nazis. Hitler committed suicide a few days before the end of the war, which ended on May 8, 1945. And every chancellor of Germany since that time became very friendly with the state of Israel and the Jewish people. Angela Merkel, the last chancellor, was very good, very positive. She established a law in Germany against preaching anti-Semitism. There was a Nazi woman in Berlin, 92 years old, and she was trying to spread anti-Semitism. And she was tried by a court and sentenced to prison for the rest of her life. Anti-Semitism is a crime against humanity. That's what the German Pope Benedict XVI declared to the war. And he appealed to the Muslim to change direction and stop teaching persecution and killing of people. We have one final question, if that's OK. Mm -hmm. um, did you encounter any people who tried to help you through the Holocaust? Did you encounter anyone who tried to help you or showed you kindness throughout the Holocaust? Yes. Last question. When we were in the concentration camp, we were sleeping in barracks on the upper level. My brother and I, my brother Sam and I, were sleeping next to each other. And right next to me was a Jewish prisoner. But he was selected to work in a bakery. And they took him every morning to a bakery in the city, and after work, he came back, and every day he brought us a piece of bread from the bakery. And that helped my brother and me 
to survive. Other than that, there wasn't a single German who tried to help. But Germany now is not the same kind of country that they were under Hitler. The German people realize that what the Nazis did was unacceptable. And they have laws against Nazis. And the Americans who occupied part of Germany after the war, they had a big effort to denazify the country. And G the German people are now very friendly. There are many Jews living in Germany, and they are thriving. And they are treated very well. And other questions? It is such an honor to have you here today. Uh, the students wanted to do a bit to give back. We have a Passover card signed by many of the students. Hog Samea, happy Passover. Um, we have a couple art projects and poems that students wrote, and a couple, um, a grade put together a compilation with a tree, a, a Jewish tree of life, and they use their fingerprints to make the leaves. So we're gonna send you home with some heartfelt, you know, um, gifts. We also have, Fairmont is so thrilled and honored to have you speak. They put together um, a sweatshirt, some, um, cups and mugs and a little stuffed animal. Just, you know, hope we hope that you can come back one day and we're so grateful for you sharing your story with us. Ladies and gentlemen, if you could give us a round of applause. One final word. May blessings follow you wherever you go and whatever you do. Amen. Amen. Amen.